example. So let's look at this picture. Up at the top, let's suppose that I'm trying to make some argument in my paper, and it's broken down into a number of sub-arguments. So I have five sub-arguments here, and I'm starting maybe with these two sort of level one arguments. Okay, I have some hypotheses, and I can sort of take some basic knowledge and make those level one arguments be true. And then building off of those two, I can get um, my third and my fourth one here. And then by combining three and four, I can make some conclusion five, which is really the point I was trying to make in this, this section of my paper, let's say. Now I have to present these things to the reader in a linear fashion, right? Because when we read through a paper, we're reading it usually in a linear order. Maybe we reference a little bit back and forth, um, reference to the past, usually not to the future, right? Um, but as we're reading through, we're going to read in linear order, and so we have to think as authors, what's the order that maybe is going to be the easiest for our reader to parse and understand this argument in? All right, and I would argue, argue that this nonlinear ordering, where we say, okay, well, these are the top two arguments. Maybe these are the first two that we started out with when we were trying to reach this conclusion five. We said, we know these are true. Let's see where we can go from there. And then we found three, and that was enough to get partway to five. And we found that if we combine one and two, we can get four. And then we can go combine three and four and get to five. Okay? If we, if we list through them in that order, one, two, three, four, five, like that, this is going to be kind of confusing for the reader. Why is it going to be confusing? Well, we say, okay, here's our background part one. Now, forget about background part one while I tell you about background part two. And then when we get to this first conclusion, maybe this first mid-step three, now you have to remember one again, okay? Now you can forget that for a moment. No, I'm going to tell you about four, but to do four, you need to remember one and two. And then we can get to the conclusion by using all of these, right? So this is a little bit tricky. You end up having to do a lot of back and forth referencing. Your reader is going to be flipping pages a lot, and it's a lot for them to store in their short-term memory. On the other hand, if you use this linear ordering, where you just say, okay, I'm going to tell you about my first basic premise and then use that one right away. And then I'm going to tell you about my second basic premise and use that one right away. Oops, and this, this arrow should be pointing down here to five and not to four. Uh, no, that's right, actually. Um, but there should be an arrow, I guess, from three to five. Sorry about that. But the point is now you can say, okay, we take these two subclauses and put them into five and we get the conclusions that we were trying to draw. So I left out one arrow. I'll excuse my error there. All right, does this make sense to everyone? Think about the order when you're, when you're putting together the body of your paper. All right, so once we get to the end of the body, we get to the conclusion. And one of the biggest mistakes I see in people's writing when they're writing a conclusion is that they just say, okay, you know, Basically, they summarize everything that they did in the paper in two paragraphs. We assumed this, we made this experiment, we took these measurements, and when we analyzed the data using these particular tests, we got uh, this result with this level of confidence. All right. In the conclusion, your reader doesn't want a rehashing of what they've already just read. It's just going to be redundant to them, right? They, they just read through your entire paper if they got to this point. So they want to know, how does this fit into the grander scheme of things? Okay, so if you want your reader to to remember your paper and to keep thinking about it, try to provide some ideas for future research. All right, so if, if, excuse me, if the person reading your article is interested in the field that you're writing about, there's a good chance that they'll read this. They'll, if they made it this far in your paper, they'll be very excited about what you've done. And they'll see, hey, here's some future research. Maybe I should start working on this too. And then they'll go write a paper and they'll cite your work because that's what inspired their work. That's a good thing. Okay. The other thing is, um, you, you really want the reader at the end to think about how what you've done relates to what they've done so that they can sort of make that connection and remember your paper when they're going forward. So this is my two bits of advice for the conclusion. Okay. Now, it's not the conclusion of, of my talk yet. Um, so. So far, we've gone through the different sections that you would have in a paper. And I've gone through them just now in the order that you would read them in. Now, let's talk about the order maybe that you want to try to write them in. Okay, This is, again, just my take on this. So take this with a grain of salt. But in my experience, I found it easiest when I'm writing to start writing the body and maybe the appendices, although I usually don't call them appendices until a later revision. But I start writing the body because when you're doing the work, you're doing the experiments, you're coming up with the algorithm and doing the analysis, 
that's when the stuff is fresh in your mind. That's when it's easiest to write these sections. Okay? After you've accomplished the work, you have the results, now you see how what you've accomplished fits in to the grander scheme of things, and you can write about what your unique contribution is, because you've made your contribution. That's when it's a good time to go back and work on the introduction. All right? And the references are being included in there throughout this writing process. So I wouldn't say have a separate you know, time to write your references. You just put them in there as you're writing the rest of your paper. All right? So that's when it's a good time to write your introduction, your conclusion. I put the conclusion after the references because, at least in my field, it's uncommon to reference new work once you get to the conclusion. So usually at that point, you want to summarize and wrap things up. Maybe you draw a few connections, but usually all the connections are drawn earlier in the paper. All right? And usually the very last things that I work on are the abstract and the title. And this is not to say that I don't come up with a uh, title for the paper you know, as we're working on it, but you maybe have a working title. Once you get to the end, you can really refine that title and think about what is the best title for your paper. All right? And I think the last point is the most important. And never, I've never, in my experience, and I, I don't know if I've ever spoken to anybody who's written a paper from top to bottom one time through, and that was enough for it to just get published right off the bat. Right? Usually, some revision is necessary. And this is where you really notice the difference between a reasonable paper and a very good paper. This is where you can tell. If people have put time into revising, thinking about restructuring and ordering things, um, it makes a big, big difference. So let's harp on revising for a moment. All right, so when you're revising, you've got some draft of what you've written already. And this is where it's usually good to, after you've finished your first draft, put down your paper, don't think about it for a day. Okay, then come back and try to read it, not as the author of the paper, but read it as some outside observer who's going to be reading your paper. And try to think about the questions they're going to ask as they're going through it. Right? Put yourself in the shoes of, of your uh, readership. So as you're reading through these arguments, are there any loose ends? Are there any statements that are made that are not well justified? You want to make sure that you try to cover all of these things as much as possible. Um, is your explanation understandable to others? This is one thing I come across quite a bit. As a researcher, you've been focused intensely for the past three months, four months, on doing your work, and you've become an expert on this particular problem. And your head is so into these details that it's easy to forget what you know and what other people don't know. Okay, so this is one reason why it can be very useful to have other people beside yourself read your paper. Um, they'll tell you, oh, hey, well, I read this, but this doesn't make sense. Something's missing, right? Um, so I'll come back to that one in a minute, but have your friends and colleagues and supervisor read drafts and provide you with feedback. And a good thing to do is when you give them a draft, don't just say, hey, could you please read this for me and tell me what you think, right? Ask them to read it with a purpose. Ask them, okay, as you're reading it, maybe don't worry about spelling and grammatical mistakes. I'll catch that stuff later. But if you come across something and it feels like there's a hole or something doesn't make sense at a high level, please tell me about that. Right? It's, people appreciate that when you uh, give them a little bit of additional instructions. Tell them what you're looking for. Okay? And if you're not a native English speaker, then it is completely fair to ask somebody who is a native English speaker if they wouldn't mind reading through your article and providing you with feedback on the grammar and spelling and things like that. Okay, so um, that's a completely fair thing to do now. If somebody does that for you, make sure you show them appreciation because it, it takes time and it takes effort, but that can also really help improve your paper. And as they do that, try to make sure that they mark on the paper so you can go back and learn from what they've tried to tell you about uh, writing. Okay? Let me come back to these two points in the middle. So you want to make sure that all of your factual statements are supported with evidence. This is one thing that differentiates uh, scientific and technical writing from other sorts of writing, which is that in scientific and technical writing, really there shouldn't be too many opinions, if any opinions, in your paper. Right? So you want to make sure factual statements are supported. And you want to make sure that if you have subjective statements or things that could be interpreted as subjective statements, try to remove those. Unless you're writing an opinion article, but um, most of the time we're not doing that if we're sending to, say, peer-reviewed conferences and journals. Okay? Good. Last point on this slide is that oftentimes when you're writing, you're going to have space limitations. 
All right, so maybe you want to send to a journal and they're restricting you to six or eight pages in whatever format template that they give you. My advice, again, don't try to target the page limit or the word limit on the very first try. Don't even think about it. Okay, the first time that you're writing a paper, put in all of the details, all of the things that you have to say. Right? Say everything that you have to say, put it all out there. It's much easier to take all that content and revise it, make it more concise, eliminate the parts that are redundant, and do that after the fact. Okay? So rewrite things as, consist as concisely as possible in the revision phase of things, not, the, not when you're writing your first draft. All right, I have a few more minutes and I'll try to leave some time for questions too. I only have a couple more slides. Um, so starting to summarize, if there's one thing that you take away from the talk today, my talk, it's that I think when you're writing your paper, try to keep your reader in mind at all times. All right? So this is a quote from an article. Um, it, the quote says, if the reader is to grasp what the writer means, the writer must understand what the reader needs. And this was written 20 years ago in an article called The Science of Scientific Writing in the American Scientist. And I think it's still very relevant today. This is something that's always going to be true of scientific writing. Okay, so understand your reader. A good way to do that, maybe this is more about writing, but this is still really to help your reader understand what you're writing, is when you're going to write, an say in a section, tell them what you're going to tell them. By that I mean, put a little summary of what's coming up. Give them a preview, give them a forecast. Okay, paint the big picture, inform them of what's coming up. That gives them some context so that when they're reading what comes next, they know how to place these pieces together. Okay. Important thing, remember you're not writing a mystery novel, right? You're not trying to uh, create some, some interesting you know, suspense and then relieve that suspense at the end of the article when you tell them what is your great finding. You want to tell them the finding up front. Remember this is more like journalistic writing, right? That first paragraph should have enough of a picture so that people see what the story is and then they can read into it to get more details. All right. Same thing, you're not writing comedy, so you're not trying to build up to the punchline. You want to get that punchline out there right at the front. All right. And after you've written and you've told them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you told them. So summarize. Um, being repetitive a little bit isn't a bad thing, especially when you've gone through a complex argument. If you summarize that again in just a, a few sentences, it really helps drive home again how things worked out. Okay. My last point that I want to make is you should take pride in your work. All right? And so presentation and formatting matter. Um, if a paper looks sloppy, then people are less likely to be attracted to read that paper. Right? So good figures are worth a thousand words, especially if those 1,000 words are words that wouldn't have been read by somebody else. But if they see a good figure, if it conveys the, the idea that you're trying to get across, um, that can be very valuable. Now, in my experience, coming up with good figures, putting the right amount of information, not overloading information, that takes them quite a bit of time. So uh, put the effort into doing that. It's worth it. Okay. Pay attention to your formatting and your page layout. Use existing tools that are out there that take care of this for you. Uh, makes your life a whole lot easier. Use spell check. It's always the worst when you're reading through an article and you see misspellings, especially uh, as a reviewer. To me, that just makes it feel like the author was sloppy. If they were sloppy with their writing, maybe they were sloppy with their research too. Right? So you don't want to convey that to your readership. And then sort of common sense things from other writing classes you may have taken. Right? Write in the active tense. Don't use passive verbs. Use good descriptors, good modifiers, correct use of commas and all these things. Um, they're in the background, but the more noise that you have in your paper, the more uh, unnecessary or uh, sort of, yeah, mistakes that are there, it detracts from the quality, it distracts the reader so that they don't necessarily get the point that you're trying to get across to them. All right, so just to summarize, three main points today that I wanted you to get are write for your reader, when you're writing, try to tell a compelling story, and take pride in your work because you've done good work and you want other people to acknowledge that too. So if you want to keep going from here, there's a number of great resources. Um, Elements of Style is sort of a classic on just writing, not necessarily scientific writing, but how to do correct punctuation and style within a paper. These other two papers, sorry, these other two books dive into much more detail, right? So you can take entire courses on how to write scientific papers. These two are maybe good places to start.
to close, I wanted to give you two quotes from famous writers. They're not scientists, but I think the quotes are still relevant. First one is from Nathaniel Hawthorne. 